Hey guys, want to welcome you back to the Make or Break show. We're hanging out with Jared Kirby today from Kirby Meets Audio, audio engineer, extraordinaire, woodworker, yeah. overall, this cool person. I was telling my wife last night, I was showing some of your stuff. I'm like, this guy's way, way cooler than me. So I'm excited. Uh, you're you're <laughs> bringing the level from nerd uh, on my end way, way up. So uh, thank you so much for jumping on and, and chat with me, man. Dude, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you asking me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, super excited to get into your story. Um, I feel like I first heard you mention way back on making it. I feel like they shouted you out like one of yeah. their super, super early episodes on, mm -hmm. on your speaker stuff. And uh, man, your builds are just insane. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be really fun to get, get into it all. But I'd love to get into your story and a little bit of uh, how you got to where you are now. So as a kid, were you always into audio we were always into making like kind of what did that look like for you yeah i i, I was i was definitely into music that's okay, really cool. i mean just like I, probably most people um very much into music and and into i was just i guess a curious person curious kid uh i love taking things apart uh i got in trouble many times for taking apart my parents computers um anything i get my hands on um uh i was also really into legos legos was big so being able to use my hands put things together build new things that that was always a big interest of mine were there any sets that you remember uh star wars it was always star wars, star wars. yeah <laughs> i've got I a few like, behind me yeah is it that bb8 is that a lego yeah one? i got okay. bb8 and millennium falcon and star uh, destroyer so <laughs> did you do uh were they like mostly sets or did you do just like some random ones too so uh, they started like, out as sets and then yeah. of course over time they'd get broken down and then put into a big box that, <laughs> that was just yeah. filled with yeah and then I, I would create my own little starships and stuff out of, out of that so that's cool so were you also um did you do much stuff on the shop side of things or was it mostly kind of the lego so i actually found a picture i could probably grab it but um yeah i found a picture of me as a little kid my next door neighbor um he built a card um dispensers for okay. for um casinos out of acrylic out of his garage so every summer that's like where i would be every day and i, I couldn't cross the line in front of the garage where the garage door closed but i would yeah. just be sitting at that line watching him work on the table saw and gluing acrylic together and all this stuff let me grab that picture i think it's just right yeah Let's see if we can get that this is me as a little kid oh, sweet. watching this guy make stuff with his hands. And, and it's really weird. I found this like two weeks ago, seeing this picture and, and it just like, I, that's what I do now. Like every day is I'm that guy. And it's just, it's really cool. Like having that connection, but I, I'm sure that's where, you know, some of my passion for using my hands and making stuff. And, and I think more than that, realizing that I could make a living making stuff on my own. I think that's where a lot of that came from, which is pretty cool. So what about it? I mean, I imagine being, cause you were what, probably like six or seven in that picture or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. What about that kept like your attention, like just to stand there and, and watch versus just I know. all over the place. I don't. Okay. So he had motorcycles. He okay. had, he had, uh, he was working on this old Ford truck that he was like, so he had, a, he had a lot of like cool things that, I guess me as a little kid really enjoyed, um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's it was it's just all the intricate little things. Like he just was doing things with his hands, making things um, that I just didn't understand at the time. I didn't understand what he was doing. So being able to watch that and seeing like something start as a big piece of acrylic turn into like this intricate thing at the end that was yeah. useful. I think that I guess that must have kept my interest somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So later, did, were you able to get in there and help them out at all, or was it always on kind of the watching side? I, I think it was always watching. I don't think I ever. I, at least I don't remember. I don't remember much of it. I I I, uh, I just remember standing there watching. That's cool. Marveling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned music. Were you in a band at all? Yes, all through high school, uh, I was in a few bands, uh, touring, um, doing stuff like that. Oh, geez. So, uh, would you play? Uh, I did vocals actually. Okay, I cool. did play guitar and a little bit of drums, um, but in the bands I, I did vocals. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, all right, so so once you got through high school, uh, what was that next step? Was it music? Was that what you were thinking? This is like this is what I want to do with my life. Well, I, I kind of realized that I probably wasn't going to be a rock star, okay. <laughs> but I I did want to be do something in music, um, and and I 
I started recording uh, my bands and friends' bands just in my room. Uh, so I thought I'd get into recording engineering. So after high school, I went to the Musicians Institute okay. in Hollywood, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, studied recording engineering, um, which was awesome, uh, really cool experience. But I, I like I said, I, I was already recording in my room, and I just happened to get in there right when. Uh, the industry was switching from big recording studios, like you had to record in like a recording studio into everybody recording themselves in their rooms. Um, so my dream of working in a big, nice studio kind of faded <laughs> pretty yeah. quickly when I realized that it was just so hard to to do that at that time. So um, after that, I, I, I kept recording uh, friends' bands, my own bands, my own music. Um, but yeah, never. I got. In, I actually did get into a few big studios and got to like experience that a few times because I had yeah. a, a friend that that worked at a pretty big studio down in Los Angeles. Um, but never, never got that job myself. Yeah, yeah. Was it weird taking like formal classes for something you were already kind of DIY doing? It was. It was strange because they had very nice studios with big SSL, uh, you know, boards and and really nice equipment. So learning that side of it uh the more technical side uh was was different yeah it was it was strange yeah yeah so what about the actual production side of it like the engineering piece did you enjoy versus just the performing piece oh yeah yeah i i um i i, I am a little technical i i do like the like i said before i'm just a curious person so i i do like the the nuances and and seeing how music can be changed in the recording process. Uh, so I, I loved it. I loved all, I love tech too. Yeah. <laughs> I love, you know, all the knobs and switches. It, it interests me a lot. So being able to do that was, was a lot of fun. That's cool. Um, so were you doing kind of um, odds and ends jobs at the same time to su support that? Or what was that like for you? Yeah, yeah. So I was working at Starbucks, okay. <laughs> like that kind of stuff. Um, um, it, the the next kind of progression was I got a job um, at Ernie Ball Music Man here in okay. San Luis Obispo, yeah, yeah. building guitars. Uh, started out in the sanding department, which was awful, <laughs> but uh, uh, at some point I moved over to the wood mill, and uh, that's really where I started my woodworking learning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so are those? Was it more like assembly line style? Like, were you? Did you specialize in like a really specific task, or or did they do like the full gambit of production? So I I got really lucky, and my supervisor Todd kind of took me under his wing, and he let me not do whatever I wanted, but he moved me around a lot. So a lot of people did have that kind of assembly line job, um, but I was lucky enough to to have kind of somebody in my corner who who saw that I had an interest in woodworking and and doing stuff on my own, um, building stuff. He, he put me around into pretty much every position in that wood mill. Um, I was able to get my hands on for at least a little while, which yeah, is yeah. awesome. What was that just process like? Was it like, did you enjoy that, that style stuff, especially since it was, since you were making instruments? Yeah. Yeah. I, I liked it a lot. It, it, it was, it was more, um, industrial production than I okay. probably would have wanted. Um, but there was still a lot of hands-on work and, and some of the, like making the fretboards that was all done by hand. There was like a jig, but that was all done by hand. Um, yeah, it, it, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> That's cool. So was it electric and acoustic or what type of guitars? Just, just electric. It was, okay. uh, electric basses and, uh, guitars. That's cool. String. Did, uh, did you get to make any of your own? No, <laughs> no, no, no. I wish <laughs> that'd be nice. They, they were way out of my price range at yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah, I did yeah. get my hands on some really nice guitars, though. But that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Did you have a a favorite part of the process? Um, so it, it's kind of weird because it's the opposite of hands on. But I really enjoyed. We worked with big Haas CNC machines okay. to do the rough cuts for the yeah. uh, guitars, and it was really fun learning which ended up being great now because I, I'm starting to get back into it, but learning the process of designing and then working with a machine of that caliber, it's, it's, it's crazy how detailed you still have to be. It's very, it's still very, very hands-on using one of those big CNC machines. Cause you have to yeah. get it perfect. If you don't get it perfect, then it, the whole thing's messed up. So yeah. Yeah. So how long ago was that when you were working? Um, that was like 2010. Doesn't it? Okay. So you yeah, definitely before kind of more the consumer style. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how were you guys designing and doing all like the cam stuff to get 
to get in with the CNCs? Yeah, so they had an engineering department. I, I didn't get into too much of that, um, but uh, I, the, I was more on the making sure that the machine was calibrated for each like setup. Got it. Um, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So, all right, so you're you're building guitars. You've been in a band. You've had the workshop experience kind of your whole life. So, what you're doing now, I guess, it definitely makes a lot more sense. But <laughs> uh, so, why speakers? Uh, I feel like I heard you, you mentioned it was something like you wanted to make your own, and you just or you yeah. didn't like what was out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, while I was working at at Ernie Ball, I uh, I was in the market just to get my own. It wasn't even Bluetooth speakers at that time. It was just like iPod speakers, and yeah. uh, I, I wanted to buy one. And I had this kind of intro to woodworking, and I, I had that interest in, in in mind. And so I thought maybe I could build my own. Um, uh, so I started doing research. I got on the forums and and looked into what actually goes into making a good speaker. Uh, and, and and I realized it wasn't that difficult. It, it really you just you know make a box. I mean, the simplest version is just to make a box. Uh, make it some sort of crossover by the speakers and solder it together. And uh, so I did that and it sounded pretty good. I, I it looked pretty cool. Um, I enjoyed I, I it. They actually wanted one. So I started building them for them. Uh, they suggested putting them on at the time Etsy. Yeah. So I did that and uh, I sold one. I used the money from that to buy components for two more. Those sold and then that turned into four and that kind of that turned into salvage audio, which was kind of my first little business for yeah. building speakers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So going back to just the very first one that you built, um, was there a moment you're like, yeah, like I can do this? Like I know a lot of people might be thinking, like I, I don't know if I'd even want to get into that whole world. Like, was it intimidating at all to you? Like, what was it, the kind of the trigger to I'm gonna do it? It was. It was absolutely intimidating. Um, and there's, I think there's a few reasons for that. One, it, all the kind of scary stuff is inside the speaker so yeah. you don't really see that you don't really you know you don't have a conceptual idea of what what goes into that the other thing is uh, when i went onto the forums it was all one very technical and two very rule-based like you have to do this if you don't yeah. do this then it's going to sound like crud you know and there's a lot <laughs> we can get into this but there's a lot of ego in yeah. the audio world which is, you know, whatever. Um, but I, I, once you get past that, and once you see that it's really just a few things uh, that you need to do, um, it, it really becomes very easy. And you just get those, do those few things, and and it's it, it's simple. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely definitely a realization process in that. <laughs> So when you uh, when you I guess plugged it in and actually had had audio or music go into it, what was it like like hearing it work for the first time? Oh, it was crazy! Like it, it, it I, I tell people this all the time. Like I, I really wish building speakers was a more popular thing, and I I I think hopefully it's starting to become more popular. That's kind of my goal, but because it, it's such a cool project to. Because music is so emotional and personal, and at least for me, I'm sure it's for a lot of people. And being able to start with raw materials and put together this thing that then reproduces that emotion and that that connection, and it actually sounds good, yeah. especially when you have this like uh, fear or not, you know, worry that it's going to be hard and that it's going to sound like not very good and and all this stuff. And then it actually sounds really good. Like it's real. It's pretty easy to make a really good sounding speaker. And I think that's because uh, a lot of most people experience audio from you know their computer speakers or right. from a small cheap uh, Bluetooth speaker or their phone uh, or their TV speakers. And those are the the quality of those are so low that just doing like two ticks above that is just like mind blowing. So yeah. when I when I plugged that in the first time and, and listened to that, I was like, holy crap, like I, I made this? Like it, it was yeah. it was really, really cool. And it blew other people away. Like they were like, whoa, you made that? And it was like, yeah, it was like five pieces. Like it was really easy. It's it's It was cool. It was really cool. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the spark. That was like the moment. I was like, okay, let's let's do this. That's cool. So was that your first kind of foray into the actual like hardware electronic piece? Uh, or like, had you had you had a little experience with that before? 
um, like electronics in general. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I uh, I took electronics in high school. Um, like I said, I took apart computers a lot when I was a kid. So I was I was I knew a little a bit a little bit about electronics, but it, it, not much. So I definitely had to relearn as I as I was learning the process. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right. So you said that your friends were asking you to build some, and then you uh, put it up on Etsy. Uh, to mm -hmm. see if you could sell once people started buying them like was that weird for you like i would like was it this could be a like a, a business for me potentially yeah I, I got really lucky i've been lucky a few times but i got really lucky getting on etsy when i did because that was like 2011 i think 2011 2012 and no one was selling speakers on etsy yeah and and i, I actually remember in the Etsy forums, there was a forum where you could submit your store and people would critique it and tell you how you could be doing better and stuff like that. And I remember getting a comment of, uh, I don't know if Etsy is a great place for selling speakers because no one else is doing it. And I was like, uh, well, we'll see. I mean, and now there's like 100 people selling speakers on Etsy. So I, I forgot the original question, but it, it, it was a uh, it was definitely great timing getting speakers on Etsy when I did. Oh yeah, it, it, it was uh, it was very interesting selling my first one and getting that money and being like, oh wow, this is like, you know, I, I could buy two more and, and that could turn into four and this could be an actual thing. And it's, and oh, I was gonna say, Etsy kind of caught on to it. They used to, maybe they still do it. They, they put out a newsletter once a day and they'll kind of highlight uh products and and i was on there a few times which was oh, cool. awesome and that was a big help in uh getting kind of my name out there and and helping the sales yeah yeah so was it once you started making those initial sales were you thinking like this could be like a full-time deal for me or was it always like this would just be a kind of a fun side gig just for some extra income coming in yeah it started out as a side gig just yeah some some fun money um i was still working on ernie ball and uh yeah and once once it once Ernie Ball started getting in the way of the speaker building. Like I, I it was hard for me to ship out the speakers on time yeah. for the sales. That's when it kind of switched and I quit my job at Ernie Ball and just focused on Salvage Audio full time. Yeah. So were you at that point like doing it all? Like like taking orders, fulfilling orders, building everything, all the marketing? Yep. Everything. <laughs> yeah, which was it was it was tough. Um, yeah. Yeah. What hard. were so what were your days like back then? Um well, I was I was living in San Luis Obispo, and my shop was in a Tascadero up here, fifteen oh, okay. minutes away. So, okay, cool. so that that commute was fun. <laughs> I'm now, I'm now up here, which is is nice. But um, uh, yeah, just waking up in the morning, checking orders. Uh, I I gave myself they were all made to order, which is probably not in hindsight that was the worst idea. Yeah, uh, especially like at scale. Um, so it would be a week to two weeks out. And I just have my list of orders that I would have to get out. And every day I just chip away at the list. Um, and then emails, emails is still a nightmare, but you know, just setting aside time every day, uh, you know, wake up, do the emails, check orders, get in the shop and then just do the best I can. Yeah. 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 So, uh, was there a point where you're like, if I can get here, maybe this number of sales or this, um, this amount of money com coming back in, like it makes sense for me to switch this full time or was it always kind of a gradual crossover? Um, it, it, yeah, it was a gradual crossover. I, I, I didn't really, I, I was kind of just going with the flow. I, I didn't, I never expected that to be a, a job or it could be a job. So I, I, uh, I would just, going with what happened like i said i as soon as it as soon as the my day job started getting in the way of making money on my side job that's when it started to switch gotcha gotcha that makes sense um all right so as you transitioned over so you mentioned uh salvage audio um like was that the what you were selling even through etsy or was that something once you kind of were building the business that's what you built it around yeah yeah i i started the etsy shop at salvage audio okay uh, and, yeah so when you quit, uh, I guess, going with your full-time job, uh, when you were actually working full-time, was that weird? Like, what was that kind of the, that first day when you're like, man, it's like, it's it's on me now to, to make this happen? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a lot of pressure. Um, luckily, I didn't have, I was, you know, this was years ago. I didn't have pressure. I didn't have financial pressures I have now. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was nice to just, it's still... 
what was nice at that time, I was in a position, luckily, to be in a bit that I, I was able to still treat it like a side job, where it wasn't, I, I, you know, I didn't have a mortgage, I didn't have, you know, I didn't even have a car payment, I, I had basically no bills other than like a phone bill and food. Um, so I, I was just, you know, rolling with it, doing as much as I could. Um, but but there was, there was definitely I mean, the, the pressure really just comes from your customers. You, you just yeah. want to do the best you can to make the best product you can and to make everyone happy. Um, yeah. it, it was definitely an interesting switch from having a boss to feeling like you don't have a boss or, or thinking that you're not going to have a boss. Uh, yeah. But but really, the boss just switches to 100 bosses. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, right. and, you know, and, and if you disappoint any of them, you're going to get 100 emails uh, wondering where their where their product is. So. Um, yeah, you don't really go into business for yourself to make anything easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just it just becomes a little more fun, I guess. Oh yeah, totally. All right. So the on the salvage piece, so were you using like reclaimed wood? Like was that where that kind of name came from? Yeah, yeah. Originally I I was uh going around uh, uh, as much salvage wood as I could. Um so that ended up being, I, I did that for a while. That ended up not being a good plan. Um, one, because the the salvaged wood or the reclaimed wood thing was a, was a kind of a, a, a big thing at the time. And that kind of started to peter out. But also building speakers using old wood isn't the best for sound. Because um, okay. a lot of, you know, there's a lot of cracks in it. And, and it, it ended up being a lot of work to uh, kind of make that reclaimed wood salvageable for you know an airtight speaker gotcha gotcha so all right so when did you go full-time um that was i think like 2013 2014 maybe okay Somewhere so right. at, at that point um were you thinking of just like i'm scaling what i'm currently doing like i'm just gonna like increase my production maybe bring people more on like was that what kind of you were thinking the foreseeable future yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the plan. Um, yeah, that, that that was the plan. It didn't really work out that way, <laughs> but uh, but that yeah, that that was the idea. So what? Uh, yeah. So what shifted with that? Um, I, I think so. One, uh, I didn't treat it as the job that I probably should have. Like I said, I was I was kind of still thinking of it as a as a part time job. I, I didn't have the ambition to turn it into like a big company. Okay. I was thinking of it more as as a uh, lifestyle, I guess you would call it now, lifestyle company, yeah. uh, where I was paying my bills, I was comfortable. And then I got into this place where I, I was getting a certain amount of uh, orders a week and I was happy with the money that I was making and I, I got content. And that contentment turned into stagnation and that stagnation turned into uh, less sales, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, and that, it just started to... To dive, which ended up being the best thing that could have happened to me, but um, but yeah, that, that's how that happened. So, for people, because there there are probably a lot of people that are listening that maybe they're on the the moment where they're working crazy with their full time job and they got this fun side gig and it's starting to take off, yeah. um, and they're thinking about scaling that production up, but then um, you hit that transition point. It sounds like where where you're seeing it starting to die off. Like, were you thinking like I need to go like find another full time job or like I need to rework this model? Um, like, what was kind of your motivation? Like, did you still love what you were doing and you just you just wanted to keep on doing it more? So yeah, um, there was. I, I think you hit on something where it was. Do I did I still love what I was doing and. It, I, I'm definitely the type of person. This was another thing that that kind of hurt the business was um, doing the same thing every day, especially like year after year. Um, really started to take a toll on me um, and my creativity and and yeah. and all that stuff. Um, and I really started to resent uh, making the same speaker every day. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that was hard. Um, finding like turning there's a, this weird thing of turning your hobby like your passion into a career or a job that kind of it's a it's a tricky thing where it it does kind of hurt it 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 it, it turns it from something fun into something you have to do and it, it, it 
I, I'm starting to figure that out now, but I'm still not great at it of, of how to keep that uh, fun drive while still, you know, being able to su support yourself with it um, was with doing the same thing every day. Um, and, and I think a, a big part of it for me, I, it's obviously different for everyone. For me it is switching it up. It has to be, I have to have something new that I'm doing uh, at, you know, if, at least once a week or, or whatever the schedule is uh, that keeps my interest in it, that, that, you know, keeps, keeps me going, keeps me motivated. That kind of cuts out that stagnation, that comfort. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you switch it up? Uh, well, I, I started YouTube. <laughs> that, yeah. that was, that was the, that was the big thing. So sales started to drop off. Um, I, I didn't know what to do. I was thinking, should I get a day job? You know, what's my next step? And I, I, I literally had like a thousand dollars in the bank and I was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to buy a camera and I'm going to just start filming myself. Um, so that's what I did. I, I, I filmed my first, I think my first video on YouTube was uh, me building the, uh, Fawn speaker, which okay. was one of my speakers that I sold for salvage audio. Um, I just, you know, I had an order. I, I filmed myself making it and put it up on YouTube and it, it didn't do anything at first, like every YouTube video. Um, uh, but slowly over time, people started to find it. And, and I, I, it's kind of funny, actually, that seems to be a trend with my build videos is that they have a really long sh shelf life. Like I, I have a few videos that have gotten over a million views and they they definitely didn't get the, to the million right away. They were like over oh, like six months or a year uh, worth of views. So um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, uh, so especially since it, it, those ramps do take a while um, on YouTube, um, like you mentioned with, with your style videos, uh, did you see that this, like this could be something that, that can bring revenue back in? Um, like how, how did you see like, oh, this, this can be something that can still work? Well, I, I guess I, I, yeah, I was hoping that it would be kind of advertising for salvage right. audio. Okay. So that like the idea was to, and I, so it was twofold, I guess. Two, one was to, create interest in, in what I was doing and hopefully people would buy the speakers. And the second was I got a lot of, my speakers were not inexpensive. They were, they were pretty expensive for what they were. Um, and I got a lot of questions of why, why would I buy your speaker when I could buy a hundred dollar speaker on Amazon for whatever. So I wanted to show them the process of making it and, and show that it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's not just like, you know, slapping some, some wood together and, um, and a lot of care and detail went into it. So that was the idea behind the first first video gotcha gotcha uh and that was i'm looking at your youtube channel now so i think the oldest one that i'm seeing is what april 12th of 2016. uh yeah. so definitely a, a little while back uh and what's what's cool even watching that one is um especially a lot of, of people's kind of first videos they uh like they may not quite know how to use a camera or like how to light stuff. And, and obviously your stuff looks a lot better now, but even back then, like you could definitely tell you knew what you were doing. Like, did you have any video experience or was this kind of your, not your first go at it either? Yeah. I, I, I've always been into movies video. Um, I actually for a long time wanted to be a writer for movies. Um, oh, so cool. I, I definitely had an interest in cinema and, and uh, cinematography um, also photography um, but I know I never really actually like expressed that by doing it. Um, I just admired it Yeah. until I started the YouTube, I guess. And then I, I guess that was just all in there, but I, I have to say, I, I, I wanted to start a video or a YouTube for a long time, but I, I, the only kind of DIY videos I was watching at that time was, um, Bob, uh, I like to make stuff and videos like that that were more tutorial style right right and and i'm i'm a very introverted person and i i didn't i i had a big fear of talking over my videos yeah so i didn't i didn't start my i didn't do it i didn't do the videos that i wanted to do because of that and then i found laura Kampf. yeah and i watched her videos and she didn't talk and she just had music and just showed her builds and i was like oh my gosh i could do that yeah. <laughs> and that that was she was a huge inspiration um, and she's an amazing person. I, she's so awesome. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, that was, that was great. <laughs> like making that realization and, and, and it's, and seeing that I could put in my, 
my creative creative idea or creativity I, whatever ideas for uh um <laughs> <laughs> like like my cinematography and and whatever like yeah yeah it, yeah, was, yeah. it was cool that's cool. So did you enjoy even the editing process, like tre treating your video like as a product too, as well as your speakers? Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, that's part of what keeps this whole thing interesting is is f watching YouTube videos and seeing other people's techniques and their editing styles and, you know, taking what I like and, and mixing it in with mine. And and yeah, that that's it is fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah, the um, I, I should have seen the Chia Kiss. I think you put Laura like as one of your recommended. Um, yeah. But I was watching your videos. I was like, oh, this feels a lot like uh, Laura's stuff. Uh, yeah. Especially from from way back then. She had her on. I forget when. Maybe been earlier this year. But yeah, she's she's amazing. That's that's she's so nice. Yeah, I, uh, I got to meet her at uh, Maker Fair. And uh, yeah, she's she's a great person. Yeah, that's cool. Um, when did you see that there was kind of this maker community, like outside of the audio side? But you mentioned like Bob, who's kind of like yeah. our like uh, go-to guy. And then you got like Jimmy Duressa, who's kind of like our godfather. Um, <laughs> did you kind of get into that world? I mean, you just mentioned Maker Fair, so you've definitely been in it now. But Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, my, uh, I guess part of what I'm trying to do is show, oh, sorry. Show yeah. makers that that this is an that this is a project option. Yeah, um, I, I really enjoy this whole maker movement. I'm definitely you know benefiting from it, and uh, um, yeah, I, I uh, I'm trying to show like that it's not that hard. I, I think people are intimidated by speaker building and, and actually getting into like the nitty gritty details of speaker building, um, and, and I would love I love for it for to be a bigger bigger thing, be more popular. That's cool. Uh, all right, so you you go onto YouTube, and you're not making as many sales just through your store. Um, did you open up other like revenue streams? Like like how are you able to kind of turn it around and and get to where where you're at now, especially? Um, so YouTube helped a lot. Okay. Um, people started to see the videos, and sales started to come in through that. So that that it, it kind of saved me. <laughs> gotcha, um, gotcha. Yeah, that investment in that camera and and the time to do that. It was a rough summer. That was a hard summer. Um, but but as soon as people started seeing the videos a little more, um, stuff started picking up, and 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 yeah, that's cool. So are you still uh, like are you still manufacturing like tons of speakers? Is that where a lot of your work is going into? So I actually, I know that not, not, not as much as then, okay. um, I, I made a switch, uh, to focusing on way more on YouTube than the speaker, you know, manufacturing, um, probably last year or a year before that, um, uh, I, I, I do plan on getting back into it. That's, that's, uh, probably this next summer. Uh, I'm going to come out with a whole new line of speakers and, okay. and really start to push that in a different way with all the lessons that I've learned. <laughs> uh, do that, do that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm focusing much more on YouTube. I find so much more enjoyment uh, making YouTube videos and 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 doing that side of it. Gotcha. And, gotcha. and, and hopefully get get the speaker building side, or, or you know the selling speaker side to somebody else and and just kind of oversee that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you would be more like on the design. Right. That's, gotcha. that's really my, my passion. Um, uh, even, even with the speaker building in my YouTube videos, there's a lot of people who spend their entire lives dedicated to making the best sounding speaker possible. Yeah. And that's not really something that I'm focused on. I, I think it's great and I love it. And I, I love, I love good sound. I love speakers that sound good. Um, but I, I really enjoy using speakers as a medium for my design work cool. um, rather than focusing only on sound. And I think it's a misconception that a lot of people have. I think the 80 20 rule applies perfectly to speaker building. Um, like if, if 100 was the best sounding speaker possible, you can get to 80% of that with only knowing 20% of the information that's out there right. with speaker building. Like you don't, you, you only really need to know a little bit to make like great sounding speakers. So. Yeah. I, I just get to that 80% and I'm happy. <laughs> like they're, they're the yeah. best sounding speakers I've ever heard. So I'm good. And I, and I focus on kind of pushing the design side and being, you know, as creative as possible with that. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, so then on, uh, and I'm asking too many like personal questions. Just tell me no, just 
just oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because especially I know people are especially interested when they're thinking through like business and monetization, um, even yeah. in like old YouTube world. So like, are your streams coming through like sponsorships? And then I definitely want to get into you. I know you're doing like plans and kit sales. Is that yeah. where you kind of see your focus going towards? Yes. Yeah. So ads is is something new that I've been doing like sponsorships for the, the YouTube videos. And gotcha. that's something I'm, I'm just starting to learn, which has been fascinating. And um, it's weird, like as a YouTuber, you're kind of part of this community of YouTubers, but unless you're actively talking to them about ads and, and how they're generating money, you really have no idea. <laughs> and yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, it could be kind of lonely where you, you don't, you don't like, so, sponsorship company, like companies uh, wanting to sponsor some of my videos will come to me and ask me, you know, how much I charge. And I have no idea. And, and I think, you know, this amount is a lot. But then I talk to YouTubers and are like, that's nothing like you need to be charging way, 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 way more. Um, so it's just yeah, it's it's a it's a it's been a very weird process of kind of learning. Yeah, you know, what 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 I'm worth, which is also weird. And, and uh, yeah, and figuring that all out yeah yeah yeah. um so you're you're well over what one hundred fifty thousand now subscribers yeah. on on youtube um when did was there a point when you saw that this was going to be something that is going to have some benefit uh or has it always kind of been a slow growth for you since you started in 20 no i think i i actually have like kind of a weird uh growth trajectory that's different from a lot of people so like you said i i um i think david picciuto um talked about my channel on making it i think that was like maybe a year and a half ago two years ago okay and and that was kind of at the beginning of my youtube channel i think i was only making videos for seven months eight months maybe and that just went crazy like my i i think i i, I think it was partly that endorsement and then I, I had some some videos that started to catch fire right before that so I think it kind of compounded and, and made this huge wave where I just like went crazy. Yeah. Um, that was my, my first million views video and That's cool. and all this. Yeah. So that so I got I had this huge spike kind of at the beginning of my channel. And then it's just been kind of dwindling ever since, which is <laughs> kind of depressing. But uh I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it'll get back up there someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you are probably also find that, that like, even though you may have less watching per video, like, if you've got those, like, hardcore fans that they're yeah. purchasing, like, it's, it's what that, the whole, uh, was it Kevin Kelly's, like, a thousand true fans? Like, if you've got right. a thousand folks spending a hundred bucks, like, that's way better than a million spending nothing. So, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, I have some awesome fans that comment on everything that, like, little community of people that I can count on to yeah. give me feedback and, and, and all that. Um, okay. So go into the actual speaker building side of things. Um, so you sell kits and plans on your site. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so if, if someone, all right, so I, I don't know much about speakers other than the fact that there's like a hole in the front and like you plug it in the back and like it seems cool if it's like it's like thicker uh but <laughs> like yeah if someone wants to get into like all right so like i want to build say i want to build uh, like a couple of like bookshelf speakers because i don't want to buy whatever sure. um like how do you how do you start down that process what's what's that look like okay so a little plug first of all i have a video series on my youtube channel that goes through at me actually designing a pair of bookshelf speakers okay, cool. through all the steps. Um, so if anyone's interested, go check that out because that's going to do a much better job explaining it than I'm going to do right here. Um, but Is yeah, I, the, how to design your own speakers in six steps. Is it that one? Yes, yeah, for, okay. exactly. Yeah. So I just, so that I have one that's completely done and that was the kind of double woofer bookshelf speakers. Okay. And then I'm on actually tomorrow I'll be releasing a video of step two of another one I'm doing that's on a 2.1 soundbar system. So it'll be a sub and a soundbar. So we're, we're going through the process. And, I, and that's really fun because I, I, I get my audience involved where they actually, you know, pick the drivers and like they, it's a, you know, an interactive experience. So I'm, people can get kind of like not really hands on, but get as much experience as they can through the video. Um, gotcha. But yeah. Uh, so really there's two things that are most important. So one is the crossover and the second is the enclosure. So if you can get those two things down, 
um, you, your speaker is going to sound great pretty much no matter what. And what's great is there's free software. Um, so for the crossover design, there's a software called VitUX, uh, which is great for beginners because there it's 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 a little challenging to you know get a like start out on, but once you get the basic idea of it, read through the the instructions. But once you get into it, it's it's great for beginners. Um, called VitUX for crossovers, and then there's a, a software program called uh, WinISD, also free. Uh, for enclosure design. Um, but yeah, there's also a great app. Let me see if I can find it on my phone. Sorry, dead, dead space. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, uh, Speaker Box Lite. Okay. It's a free iPhone app. And, and that, that, that one's great because it has a kind of directory of, it has a library of drivers already in the app that has all the TS parameters, all the technical information you need on the driver already built in. So you just pick your drivers, you know, say, uh, you know, like what type of speaker you're making, whether it's a boom box or, and it'll give you exactly the, the enclosure. It even gives you the design, like it'll tell you, you know, how big to make it like the dimensions even. So gotcha. those are great programs, but, uh, that, that's where I would, I would start, uh, if you're going to make a speaker. Gotcha, gotcha. And since I am very uh, dumb and, and don't know, so when you say crossover, <laughs> is is that just like all the electronics inside? Is that what that, that means? Or right. So uh, the human ear can hear between twenty hertz and twenty thousand hertz. So twenty hertz down the bottom, that's a big bassy booms, and uh, twenty thousand hertz is the highs, the cymbals, and stuff like that. So one speaker has a really hard time reproducing that entire frequency spectrum because it has like just physically physics. Um, so what we do as speaker designers is we split those, that spectrum up into multiple little sections. So we'll have something called a tweeter, which is really good at reproducing the highs and then something called a woofer, which is really good at reproducing the lows. And, but the speaker gets that full spectrum into it from the amp. So that audio spectrum needs to be split into the tweeter so it just gets the highs because it can't handle the lows and then the woofer just gets the lows because it can't handle the highs got it so that splitting process is is done by usually a passive unit which is a grouping of components uh inductors capacitors and resistors that's called a crossover got it got it is that what so when i'm looking at your site and that's the, it almost looks like it's like an, a little arduino or like a little uh like circuit board, is that the actual like crossover electronic piece? No, that's that's, that's okay. the amp. That's the Whoa. amp and and the and the Bluetooth board. Okay, gotcha. So that's what so that's in a powered speaker that that's what powers it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so the, that, the crossover components are those kind of black cylinder looking things, and then the uh, like wound copper wire. Got it. Got so it. those are the passive components that are then soldered together to to create the crossover. Gotcha. Um, and for people that are like buying components, um, and so like your kits, I, I, I'm sure are great, great places to start. But like, are these things easy to come by, especially now? Like, if you're looking for specific oh, yeah. specifics, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's lots of places online. Um, uh, a really good place is Parts Express, and I recommend them um, because I know them. They're very nice people. Uh, but they're also their website's very easy to navigate. Oh, cool. um, they also have a great customer helpline. So if you if you're building a, a speaker and you even if you don't know where to start, you just email them and and they'll help you. That's they'll cool. get you started for sure. Um all right. So then on the actual the design piece, and I you mentioned you mentioned it a little bit already, uh, but it feels like you've got this kind of balance between like pure like audio quality versus like I don't want this thing to look ridiculous in my house. Yeah. Um <laughs> and it sounds like you fall a little bit on the like I'd like to look like look nice as well like what are some of the um constraints because you want something like visually appealing in your house that you find you put into your speakers versus if you just wanted something that would just be the most premium audio yeah so so the big one is size okay so a lot of people don't want huge speakers in their house right. and really to get that full spectrum from 20 hertz uh, down to 20 hertz you need a big speaker gotcha um so cutting that back to 50 hertz and, and only going from 50 hertz up to 20,000 hertz, that's more of a, a manageable 
uh, spectrum to be able to reproduce in a in a, a normal size speaker. Um, that that's that's probably the biggest one. Um, yeah, another it's usually the stuff has to do with size of the enclosure. So Got the it. the the skinniness of the speaker uh, also is is kind of not great for uh, sound reproduction because the sound can then uh, reverberate behind the speaker, hit the back wall, and then come back at you, which okay. creates weird time delays and 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 uh, weird stuff like that. So, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so do you, um, have, or how many, how many speakers do you use of your own? Like, what well, was the one that you yeah. use the most? Um, it's usually whatever I've built last, <laughs> Okay, <gotcha. laughs> but my house is like, my living room is full of, of speakers, which is kind of ridiculous. And I need to start getting rid of them. Um, uh, yeah, there, I, I have, I have speakers in my kitchen. <laughs> I have speakers. I have like four pairs of speakers in my living room five actually I have some in a bookshelf uh in this room this is my little like studio recording i have a listening area off to this side i have actually the speakers from um that the design series that i did with the two woofers those are sitting on my listening area right now i've been kind of tweaking the crossover on that one um yeah i have i have sample ones there's some like prototype speakers back okay. here yeah, I, I, they're they're everywhere. <laughs> it's crazy. What's your favorite? If you oh gosh, uh, that I've made. Yeah, the chief made. Um, probably the CNC speakers that I actually just okay. just made. The, I, getting the CNC, I am so excited for the stuff I'm going to be doing over like the next year with that machine. It, it it's going to be awesome. So yeah, I, yeah. I think those just like the look of it, and I I haven't seen a lot of speakers that incorporate kind of 3D designs within the speaker like that. Um, so I'm really excited to to get started with with having fun with that. Yeah, that that video, because I mean, that was what, just a couple weeks ago or a week ago? Like, wasn't... Yeah, yeah, that was... At all. I'll, uh, I'll definitely uh, include it in the in the show notes. Um, Thank you. It was a, what, a shape okay? Is that what you're using? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen a ton of that texture. And when I saw that, I was like, why haven't people done this more like this is super this is so i cool. know <laughs> yeah. so i have to give all all credit to uh michael vo from uh the hard knocks woodworks uh instagram he 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 actually got one of my kits and did that to the front of one of my kits and sent me a, a picture and i was like blown away oh, yeah. um so he showed me how to do it he helped me a lot with that project so definitely go check out check out his instagram channel or yeah. page um but yeah yeah I, I, it's shocking that you know <laughs> how many years it's been of people building speakers and and it's the first time i've ever seen a texture like that and and there there is some so that that, that falls into design over sound right. because that does it has to affect the sound in some way i i will be testing um, the resonance from that front baffle compared to a flat front baffle in the next few weeks. Um, but I don't think it's going to be as much as some people <laughs> think yeah. it's going to be. Um, yeah. And, and, and there's, I think there's a lot of, uh, this is going to get a little technical, but I think there's a lot of, uh, for actually using patterns like that to, you know, do different things with the sound. You can actually make maybe make this speaker even better using textures like that being able to uh you know uh change the flow or the the radiation of the the sound from the speaker yeah yeah it's cool it's like in a like a like a symphony hall like it's all yeah. built to yeah and well, right right yeah all the resonances and, and all that stuff yeah absolutely uh that's sweet um and then let's see i did have there was a question that came in uh that was from i'm trying to pull it up from JT Woodworks. And I think he's actually referencing this uh, your CNC build um, on the actual finish of that uh, baffle. Oh yeah. Um, is there was there much sanding that you had to do? Involved no. In so um, <clears throat> on the texture part, there was no sanding at all. Okay. Um, which was really cool. It, it took a really long time to cut on the CNC because it had like the tiniest step over. Um, that's why in the video you could see a, a sped up version yeah. of, it, of it going through and kind of smoothing everything out. That took a really long time, but uh, yeah, didn't need to sand it at all, uh, which is really nice. Uh, and then kind of expanding that out, 
do you have to finish things different than you would just like a traditional woodworking project because it's made for audio or can you kind of treat it the same way as paint with paint and oil and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I treat it the same. Uh, I don't see any reason why it would be different. Um, yeah, it's pretty much just traditional woodworking at that point. That's cool. Uh, well, sweet. Well, so uh, wrapping up, uh, looking down, uh, maybe like a year down the road, do you see more of the same for you? Just crazier maybe builds and then stepping back into the manufacturing piece as well? Yeah, definitely much more uh, YouTube build videos. I, I really want to focus on getting as many projects out as I can. Um, and then, yeah, to, uh, starting uh, another speaker line that that has incorporates uh, that kind of 3D geometric CNC cut designs. Gotcha. That's cool. Have you done um, like full like surround sound like home audio or yeah, uh, home, uh, home theater? Or is that or is that like me asking something really dumb? Is that not even? No, no, okay. no, not at all. Um, so uh, I, I have I've never done a project that's specifically for that, but I've used um, projects that I've previously done in a surround sound situation. Exactly. So like I have uh, uh, bookshelf speakers that are perfect for satellite speakers for okay. home theater surround sound. So I, I've used those and then center channel for the same same situation. Uh, and then this also might be a really dumb, dumb question. Uh, so if I wanted to, like, I love uh, like Sonos and like all the cool stuff yeah. people can do with that. And I saw like you've got some like teardowns of their play bars and everything. Yeah. Like if I wanted to build my own speakers and just like plug like Alexa into that, is that yeah. hard to do? No, not at all. It's literally like you said, just have, I have an Alexa on a pair of my speakers in my living room and okay. it, it's literally just plugging the Alexa into the back of the amp and it turns into a smart speaker. It's really gotcha. cool. And I'm going to be doing projects uh, with that in the, in the near future. It's, gotcha. it's a great, great way to do it. So it's just like the little dot and you just plug it in like you would a normal. Yeah. Just right into the aux input and then cool. turns into a smart speaker. That's crazy, man. <laughs> uh, sweet. So, uh, well, thank you so much for your, for your time and, uh, and chat so much. It, uh, it was a blast for people that want to check all of your stuff out. Um, what are the, is it, so it's KMA kits for your like plans and everything. Is that right? Yes. KMA kits.com. And then uh, Kirby meets audio over on YouTube. Any other, any other places you'd send people? Uh, just Instagram. Uh, and it's just Kirby meets audio, but that's it. That's the big three. Cool, man. Well, uh, well, thank you so much. It was, uh, it was a blast chatting with you. Dude, it was awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah.